Good morning, everyone. This is the severe weather roundup. So if that's what you're looking for, you are in the right place and we'll get started shortly. If you want to just place your name and where you're zooming in from today in the chat box, that'll kind of let the rest of us know um, who we have here this morning. So um, feel free to go ahead and, and do that. I see some of you have already done that. So um, thank you and we'll get started momentarily. All right, well, good morning. My clock says 10.01, so we're gonna get started here. Um, just wanna welcome everyone to the webinar this morning. My name is Tracy Simpier. I'm the Vortex Southeast Outreach and Engagement Coordinator, and I'm here at the Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant Consortium. I'm physically located in Ocean Springs, Mississippi at the Gulf Coast Research Lab, which is part of the University of Southern Mississippi. And so I was just telling our panelists when, as they were logging on that we were wearing flip-flops this weekend. And now this morning, <laughs> we have to don the sweaters and the coats <laughs> because we had a front come in last night. Um, so we're so happy to have all of you with us today. And I'm just gonna go through a few things on this next slide to ensure that we all have a a great experience. So I mentioned a few minutes as some of you were logging on, if you could just enter your name in the chat box and where you're zooming in from, that gives us all an idea of sort of who's on the webinar with us today. And even though we can't see all of you, we're doing that so that then we make sure we don't interrupt our presenters. So we've got you in webinar mode, but you can still interact with us during our town hall today. So you can submit your questions using the Q&A box, and then our panelists have the option to answer those live questions as I prompt um, when we're on that subject, or they can um, type answers to your questions in. Um, we are recording the video today. We want to make sure um, that it can be available to those that maybe couldn't um, join in person. And we also want to let you know that there's going to be links to resources that we're going to be placing in the chat box throughout the hour that we have together. And so we'll make sure that those are also available to you after the webinar. If we run out of time for some questions, those will be answered in writing and we'll send that out when we send out the link to the recording of the webinar. So don't worry if we don't get to your question, we're going to do the best we can in the hour time that we have. So before we get started, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of why are we doing this? What is Vortex Southeast Outreach? So Vortex stands for the Verifications of Rotations in Tornadoes Experiment Southeast, which is a mouthful, I know. But it's a really unique project in that it brings together meteorologists and researchers and social scientists, and they all collaborate on this larger research program at the National Severe Storms Lab. And they're looking at storms and the conditions that produce tornadoes in the Southeast United States. So keeping us all very safe. And in partnering um, with the Vortex Southeast program, Sea Grant is hoping to accomplish both with outreach and engagement to have like a two-way dialogue with the audiences that are most vulnerable that really need this information. We wanna make sure people are receiving science-based information straight from the National Severe Storms Lab. And we wanna be sure that we understand the needs on the ground. So I'm an extension specialist. I'm here going to schools or going to um, outreach events or hosting outreach events and then I'm feeding that information back to our larger project team and then together we're trying to make sure we can respond to the needs on the ground with accurate and trusted information that are delivered by folks like extension specialists and researchers and scientists and so today is one of our um, outreach events and so I'm really pleased to be able to introduce you to our panelists this morning. I'm going to do a brief introduction just for time purposes, but first we have Alan Gerard. And Alan, if you want to wave to everyone, I can see where you are. 
okay? And then Alan is the chief of the Warning Research and Development Division, and he's also the Vortex Southeast Federal Program Coordinator. So um, Alan has, he came to the National Severe Storms Lab after already spending 25 years with the National Weather Service. And actually a lot of that time Alan spent in Jackson, Mississippi, so just north of where I'm sitting today. He oversees several programs developing new warning technologies for all types of weather hazards. So welcome, Alan. Um, next we have Kim Clock on McLean. Kim, if you want to wave to everyone, they can see you. Kim is a research scientist and she's also a team lead, and I have to say this name slowly, for the Cooperative Institute for Severe and High Impact Weather Research and Operations. This is a cooperative agreement between NOAA and the University of Oklahoma. Um, and she is also sitting in Norman, Oklahoma. Kim's research applies behavioral science methods to address pressing issues in the management of weather and climate risk, especially in the communication of forecast uncertainty and response to hazardous weather warnings. So welcome, Kim. Next, we have um, Dr. Justin Sharp, who's also a research scientist and a social science coordinator um, for the Vortex USA project. His research includes tornado epidemiology, risks and vulnerability to inform wider research, research parameters. He also likes to do action research. And most recently, Justin and I worked a lot on the co-production of knowledge and learning um, because that's really the heart of his research. Um, Justin really likes to be able to allow community, community participation in the research that he does um, and, he, and focus on closing the value action gap in protecting people when storms and tornadoes occur. So welcome, Justin. And we also have with us um, Dr. Tony Liza, who is the physical science coordinator. Yep, thank you for waving. Um, and Justin is also at the Cooperative Institute for Severe and High Impact Weather Research and Operations, also located at, um, in Oklahoma. And his research experience includes observational analysis of the influences of terrain on the near storm environments of severe storms, also in the investigation of mesovortex and tornado evolution with quasi-linear convection systems and post-storm damage assessment. Again, a mouthful. And so um, welcome, Tony. So we are so glad to have you guys today. Thank you so much for spending time with us and answering questions. And I want to just move on to the format for today's webinar, just so everyone is on board with how we're going to do this. Um, we received questions for about a month's period of time, kind of the end of October, all the way through November. And we threw it out there and said, what are your questions about severe weather? And we got a lot of questions. And so those questions really form into five categories, communications and alerts, personal safety, what I'm calling technically speaking, a little bit more technical um, answers to those questions, lightning, and then we had some historical questions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the questions that were submitted. We've tried to kind of group them in this way. And so as our experts are answering these groups of questions, if something else comes to mind, like, oh, I wonder about this aspect of that, then please put that in the Q&A and then we will check that and try to make sure we get your question in. Um, but again, if we don't get to your question today, don't worry, we're gonna provide written answers to those questions that weren't able to be featured today in the town hall. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hope that you can now see all of the panelists. And we're gonna get started with our first category of questions, which is about communications and alerts. So I'm gonna introduce this real quick and then I'm gonna um, throw it over to, I believe, Kim to start us off. So in this category of questions, we had a lot of people asking, how do I get things, communications and alerts on my phone? How do I make sure that those alerts are specific to my county or where I'm living? Um, where, where can I sign up for those alerts or what app do I need? Those kinds of questions. And then in, in addition to the phone aspect, also like what is a NOAA weather radio? Should I have one of those? And where can I get one of those? And so there was a lot of questions just dealing with how can I be informed? So I'm gonna throw that one over to you to start Kim and then everybody else can chime in. 
Yeah, I think it'll be one of those things where there just are a lot of things out there. So our panelists might have a lot of different recommendations for you. But I want to start by um, you know, assuring you that there are just a lot of options. So you can find something that meets your needs pretty easily. Um, if you're interested in having alerts that are pushed to you, so making sure that you don't miss if there's a warning um, that is in your area, one of the best ways to get the most spatially like targeted in your area kinds of alerts comes through uh, cell phone alerts. And part of that is just because we can find your, your cell phone if you have your location services turned on or at least enabled for the app. And um, so those are available through a number of different private vendors. There are weather companies, the, you know, sort of AccuWeathers or even weather.coms of the world, um, you know, these big companies that have apps that distribute warnings. But there are also apps that all of your local TV stations put out to um, distribute local warnings and other information. You may want to check those out as well. So there's everything in the spectrum from that to some of the more reliable methods. So the number of um, the questions that came in were about things like, what do I do if the power goes out? Or, you know, what, what is weather, no weather radio? And, I, you know, as much as cell phone alerting is very, very targeted, sometimes some of these other technologies that are broadband, um, you know, distribution are more reliable and weather radio certainly is one of the most reliable. So this is something that NOAA manages. The National Weather Service puts its warnings out on, on its weather radio devices. And so you just need to have the, um, the radio in your home and it will flip on when a warning goes out and you can set it to, you know, if you want to know about severe thunderstorm warnings, you can learn about those. Um, if you want flash flood warnings, if you want tornado warnings, um, you can make it adjustable to sort of any of those. Um, otherwise, your TV also, if you have it on when severe weather is possible, it'll push emergency alerts to you as well. And um, that's, you know, your local stations will be, will be doing that broadcasting. With that, I'll throw it over to the others, but there are just a lot of different ways to receive weather information if you, if you want it. I think, you know, it's just one key to reinforce, you know, however you get your information, make sure you have more than one way to get it because any one of those different sources could potentially, you know, fail with a loss of cell phone coverage or the, the a failure of a certain old weather radio transmitter during the course of a severe weather event, those things do happen. So you just want to make sure you don't just rely on one source once you have it, that you have multiple sources to get that information. Yeah, and to that end, actually, I'll just put something in the chat because uh, I noticed that our support is putting thing in there from ready.gov alerts. And sometimes you have to scroll through quite a lot of stuff to get to the stuff that you really want to know, which is how do I turn it on? How do I turn it off? And the little guide that I've just put in the chat there shows that for Samsung phones, Android phones and iPhones. And it's very, very simple. And I think that's what's really key there. But it's really simple to turn on and off. Um, and, and that's really good. Um, and having said that, as a British person, having got severe weather alerts, the one thing that's always woken me up and has always got me uh, moving has been the, the uh, no weather radio. That just, you know, it, it really gets you moving you, and, and it doesn't go off unless there's something to, you know, to, to talk about. So there you go. I'll just add with weather radio is obviously that's not, um, reliant upon, you know, you can you can have a battery backup for a weather radio, so it's not reliant upon uh, commercial power necessarily. It's not reliant upon, uh, you know, cell phone towers. It's 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 kind of an independent uh, source of information. And one of the things we really try to stress is to have multiple sources. And if you have a weather radio that gives you kind of almost like a backup to what you can get through your cell phone. Uh, that reminds me of something actually, I'm just gonna hold this up to the screen, but this is a, a, a graphic that we developed. And the idea is that uh, tornadoes can happen at night, but also to get multiple alerts. I don't know if people can see that clearly or not, but uh, you know, this is one of the messaging that we've been working on with Tracy and with the Sea Grant program that we've been uh, collaborating with. So um, if you want one of these, by the way, um, reach out to Tracy and uh, we'll try and get one of these out to you. 
And one of the parts of the question, I think, was about where someone could get or purchase a NOAA weather radio. Simply Amazon, you could do that. I mean, I don't know if you might want a more local thing, but if, if you just need to find something very, very quickly, there are lots of choices there. Um, there are probably several manufacturers, but I, I do know that there's one, I'm not going to say which one it is, I feel like I'm the BBC here, not allowed to advertise, but there is one that actually, you'll see it absolutely everywhere. Um, and um, I picked mine up for around about 20 bucks. So ju just, to, just to let you know, uh, we're not talking a, a particularly large investment, but it, it saved us several times. You know, we, we had two things this, uh, this autumn and, um, you know, my wife just come out here, so it was all a bit scary, but we were all prepared, so it's good. And I'll just add really quickly, one of the things people can sometimes, if you both love and can sometimes be frustrated about with weather radio is that, I mean, it is really loud, it wakes you up. If you're like me and a parent of young children, they've come up with an interesting solution for this where um, you can get a little attachment that goes under your pillow and it'll vibrate. This is also for people who have hearing impediments, but it will vibrate to alert you when there's a warning that you need to attend to. So it will still do that waking you up piece without necessarily waking up your baby in the process if it's not necessary. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. I was trying to make sure I got the um, Justin's um, link into the chat to make sure everybody could see it. And then also, if you'd like a magnet, I wanted to put my contact information in there for you. Um, I'm going to move on to um, the next uh, question. And I'm going to read this one off because I think it has some context around it. And then I'm going to probably start with you on this one, Alan, um, just to let you know. So this person said that oftentimes hurricane and tropical storm watches and warnings are issued with a supplemental statement that says something like protect home and property. Oftentimes cities, counties, and other local jurisdictions are swamped with phone calls during and after intense rain events and some of the calls include citizens that were caught off guard by a heavy rain event that was forecasted. It seems as if citizens may need a little coaxing as to what may happen when a heavy rain event is upon them. So the question is, can flash flood watches and warnings be supplemented with a similar statement, something along the lines of protect your home and property if you are in a low-lying area? And so I'm going to um, kind of let you start that one off, Alan. Okay. Yeah, um, that's, those are obviously really good points. And the the reality is the, the, the products, the, the forecasts and warnings and watches that the Weather Service issues do contain that kind of information. Um, that, that sort of statement is called a call to action and pretty much every watch and warning that the Weather Service issues has something like that in, in it, including flash flood watches and warnings and hurricane watches and warnings. Um, but obviously most folks rely upon um, uh, broadcast media and others for, uh, you know, for hearing that kind of information. So I'm, one of the things I think that uh, we as a weather community overall are really trying to work on is to try to educate the public that in many ways, uh, flash flooding is the most dangerous uh, you know, severe weather uh, risk that most people are going to face on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, so I, I really think that in a lot of ways, that's, that's the, and I'm, hopefully my other panelists can add some info, but I, but I, I think that really the kind of the key to this question is that uh, all of us working together in the meteorology and emergency management community just really need to work to educate people in general on the, you know, the serious risk that heavy rain and flash flooding pose and uh, what actions they can take to, you know, to help protect themselves. I think what's important there as well, that when we say public, we actually mean everyone, including like broadcasts and TV and news stations, because sometimes the, the message gets a little bit lost and, and they f focus on one particular part of, uh, of uh, you know, a kind of a newsworthy disaster or hazard rather than the one, as Alan is quite rightly saying, is actually causes the, the most amount of 
deaths, I think that, that uh, flooding generally causes the highest amount of, uh, of fatalities um, in severe weather generally uh, 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 across there. But I guess the headlines are, you know, from tornadoes as well, which of course are serious and we need to pay attention to. But it's actually getting the broader picture, not just focusing on the one headline grabbing thing. So I think that's what we mean when we say public. We mean everybody as much as possible. And Kelm, did you want to speak to the question that you answered in the q and I'm not sure that all of the um, participants can see the questions, but um, I, I think that was a, a, good, um, a good question. Yeah, there was a great question that came in about broadcasting warnings for drivers and that there are these really great billboard systems now that are electronic. And the question was, hey, is anyone leveraging these to, to broadcast warnings live? And that's happening in some places. It actually it just requires the local forecast office to have a relationship with the vendors who run those billboards. And um, for those who aren't aware, the National Weather Service is divided into 122 local offices spread across the country. So it's happening a little bit piecemeal, um, but there are places where it's happening. I know here in central Oklahoma, when we have tornado warnings, the billboards do um, convey that and encourage people to get off the road. So. Um, Great question and you know, look for that in a place near you. If it's not happening yet, you can always try to reach out to the vendors who run those billboards and encourage them to get in touch with the National Weather Service, say that you want them to do this. Um, you know, th These partnerships are all local. So if you wanna see it happen where you are and it's not happening, please do do it. Uh, I think the other thing I wanted to add there, Kim, is actually we'd had conversations, I know a, a, a few months back, about how we might actually start to get these things into alternate kind of TV providers. So not everybody sits there and just watches their local TV station. Maybe they're watching Netflix, maybe they're watching HBO Max. So, you know, whether we'll get to that position and time where we'll be able to do that for local markets somehow that, you know, for in those areas based on your IP, it will kind of be able to push a warning out from that. And I wondered, I wondered what you thought about how how far away we're from something like that or whether that's actually you know is that such a complex thing to do or not just because i think you have the answers for that maybe alan might have some answers for this too it's something that we're working on um, at the lab with the um developers of especially the next generation of television technology so you know we've had the digital upgrade recently and there could be yet another upgrade um that's coming that would enable something like that and you know, it's, it's, gosh, in, in terms of timeline for when that might happen, I, I realistically, you know, the, the optimistic people always want to say five years, but I, I, this would be like a 10 year, probably. Um, I don't know if Alan has any more insight on the, the likely timeline of something like that. No, I think that's probably a pretty good estimate. Uh, I mean, what, what's being worked on is, um, you know, kind of this next generation television technology is is really exciting and has the potential to do a lot of the things that, you know, would get people uh, warning information through their television, like Justin said, through IP, whether it, whether they're watching a local network or whether they're watching Netflix or whatever the case may be. But um, it's, it's something that I think it's going to be a gradual process to become implemented in the public and it'll probably take a number of years, but but it definitely has a lot of potential. Great, so we're gonna kind of move into our next category, which is personal safety. I just wanted to make a quick note that Chris asked a really great question in the chat box. And I think that we'll get to that, Chris, um, or at least some of that, um, and not in this category, but the next one. So just I'm just letting you know, because I think it's um, really relevant because it's um, so recent. So we're gonna move to the personal safety category. And in this category, a lot of people had questions that were kind of, what do I do if I'm inside a building? And what do I do if I'm outside a building? And there were a lot of different um, iterations of how people asked the question. Some people were curious about like, um, if I'm inside and I wanna take a shower, is that really safe? Um, if I'm outside and um, I don't see shelter, should I go get in a ditch or should I get in my car? So there were a lot of questions about sort of where do I go when I'm inside and outside related to their personal safety and just um, sheltering in general. So I'm gonna hand that over to you guys and, um, and see if you can give us some advice about what are the best things and what are maybe more like urban legends. 
I'll kickstart this conversation um, with, you know, the, 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 a lot of the questions that came in, there are different answers for different hazards. And I think that's something that's important to, to think through. So there was a question about flooding. What do you do if you're outside and caught in a flash flood? Well, for that, the answer is to try to get as high as possible, as fast as possible. And you know, one of the, the famous um, tragedies that was studied in flood response was called the Big Thompson Canyon flood in, I think, 1979. A lot of people were in a mountainous area and they tried to escape a flash flood by going down a road to get out of the park. And that road was what became the channel for the water. It became a river. And if they had just gotten up on the embankment, the people who did get up on the embankment just climbed like five feet out of their car and got into you know the trees, they made it. And, um, you know, so sometimes escape doesn't have to be, oh, I've got to flee this whole area to make it. You just have to get up and it can be counterintuitive feeling. Um, but there are other situations where, of course, the um, advice can be opposite. So we're looking at things like tornado events. There's a question, is it better to be in a ditch or a car during a tornado? And I want to say there is a lot of confusion about this point out there, in part because different groups are saying different things. The National Red Cross has run with this recommendation to stay in your car and buckle up and sort of duck down and you know try to try to protect yourself um, within the frame of the car. But FEMA and the Weather Service haven't signed on to that. And the problem is we just don't have really great epidemiological data. We don't understand, we don't know how survivable one is versus the other, getting in a low-lying ditch versus being in a car. Um, it, it's just not something that we have a lot to run off of. And so um, different people are kind of hedging different ways. What I personally think it comes down to is you have to sort of evaluate for yourself your situation. If you can safely try to drive away from a tornado, they are generally so small that that is probably a good idea if you can see where it is and it's going and you have a clear way out. Personally, I would not want to be in a car um, and, and I would try to seek refuge elsewhere. And that's just gonna come down to a personal decision. The car might be able to protect you to some degree for like, especially low end tornadoes, um, but cars are, really not great to be in um, at, at higher, you know, higher intensity tornadoes um, that can actually be a thing that can can hurt you. So it's it's definitely a trade off. And with that, I, I want to pass along to other people. I think one of the most complicated things we face is advice for if you encounter both of those two things, a flood and a tornado at the same time, where the recommendation for the flood is to get up and the you know recommendation for tornadoes is to get down. And again, a lot of that is going to come down to your particular circumstances and just being very aware um, of, of what's happening around you and then having to make a, a call um, for a lot of people. I think it's important to be empowered with the knowledge that if you live in a site built home and you're in it when you get both a flash flood warning and a tornado warning, as long as your house isn't actively flooding, I would say being on the, you know, the first floor and in an interior room with as many walls between you and the outside as possible is probably your best bet. Most everyone survives that if you have a tornado coming. Um, if you're in a site built home and you're inside, uh, you know, even for bad tornadoes, totally survivable and flash flood warnings, you know, sometimes they're issued when water is coming into where you live and sometimes it's just water in creeks surrounding you. Uh, you know, so if your house isn't actively flooding, I would feel confident being in that lowest floor place in responding to that. Um, if you're in like a basement unit or something, I might think, you know, get get up to maybe a first floor at least so you, you're not stuck. Um, I don't know if other people want to offer more insight on some of that though. So I will, I, uh, oh, Alan is typing an answer to this one right now. So I'll let Yeah, you... yeah I, I can go ahead and finish that one. But I, I was also going to say, well, I mean, I can, rather than typing, I can just answer the question here real quick. It'll only take a second. Um, uh, there was a question about uh, sheltering in your car under a bridge oh. or an overpass. And uh, I'll just, that is still, we still say that that is not a good thing to do uh, because there is evidence that, that the wind is actually channeled under uh, bridges and is actually more intense under the bridge than it is if you're uh, away from it. So. And then there's the whole issue of um, potentially causing traffic jams, which can put more people in jeopardy. So the bottom line for that question that was answered is yes, we 
we do not recommend that you try to seek shelter under a bridge or overpass. And then one other thing I just wanted to add real quick to what Kim was saying is that, um, you know, as she mentioned that, you know, a lot of these sorts of questions really depend on your very unique situation. And, and there are also, there are sometimes it's, you know, what we refer to as the course of least regret, you know, where there is no perfect answer if you're, uh, you know, if you're being impacted by, a, you know, a strong to violent tornado, there, there is no necessarily completely safe option, you know, unless you've got a, you know, a storm shelter that's reinforced to survive, you have five winds. So um, the, the, you know, the, the recommendations that you're given, and Justin, I think said this in the chat, there's a range of scenarios. We're trying, you're trying to find the, the best, but it's, but there is no perfect answer in most of these situations. Yeah, and, and I think it, it, it's partly your situation, and that situation can also include what you have access to in terms of uh, funding for things like that. Not everyone can afford the top level FEMA compliant shelter. So what are, what's the next best option to that? What's the next best thing we can do? And the page that I put in the chat there, there's one thing that says tornado sheltering guidelines, and it goes from worst, bad, good and best options. And the thing is, you've got to probably work out, well, where am I here? what can I afford to do to make myself a little bit better? What is the what is the very least that I can do to make myself and my family safe? And there was another graphic there also that shows exactly what to do if you're just in a, you know, your average home, where you should be, where you should try and seek shelter. And we're still saying as much as possible, interior walls, interior bathrooms, if you don't have a shelter, those sorts of things. Um, so, you know, do explore these things for yourself. I think that's the other thing as well. Uh, don't be, you know, um, be, be curious and actually go, okay, well, what, what, what can I do? Where am I right now? What can I do to improve? These small incremental things will probably be the things that are more the lifesavers rather than the great grand gestures, in, in my advice anyway. And is it recommended to have some kind of head protection? I've seen a lot of pictures to that that's effect. A yeah, that's it. Thank you for reminding us. That's absolutely perfect. Yeah. And, and, and it's great for kids as well. And I think the other thing as well, and I had to do this as a person coming from England and then experiencing tornado warnings, nowhere to go, be prepared ahead of time. You know, for us, we, you know, made sure that it was, the bathroom was there. We had like a great big um, um, thing off the sofa to go over our heads, but we did have cycle helmets for the kids. Uh, you know, skate helmets, cycle helmets, scooter helmets, any of those things that give that bit of protection is really good. And again, it helps the children understand what's going on and that they're being protected and you're doing the same way to protect them in the same way that you might not let them go out on a bicycle without a helmet. <laughs> we say the same thing for a tornado. So yes, that's perfect. And if I decide I want to take a shower during a thunderstorm, is that safe? That was a question we had come in. So uh, the, the advice with this one is very much to do with water. We know that water and electricity don't mix. So that's potentially one of the main reasons for that. Also, if your plumbing is, is metal, and I don't, I don't know everyone knows exactly what their plumbing is, but there are copper pipes going into things, and that might be in the ground if it strikes near the ground and is not grounded in the way, there's the potential for, for that there. So it seems like it should be an urban myth, but the advice still seems to be that actually it's not a good idea to do that. I mean, it's the same as, I don't know, you wouldn't go licking some metal in a thunderstorm, would you, outside? It's the same, you're tempting fate by doing something like that. And then I just want to bring in then the car in, in this one, because I think it's these kind of fit together here with the lightning and what to do. Um, if you're outside, you need to get inside. That's that we sort of know that. We talk about the 30-30 rule, which is uh, 30 seconds between the flash and the bang. You should definitely be moving inside. And then you wait 30 minutes after the last sort of flash and the bang to go and resume activities outside again. Um, if, if you can go inside a house when thunder roars, go in, go indoors. It's a nice rhyme, but it makes sense. That indoors can also be inside a car if you're sort of say, maybe if you're hiking somewhere and you get back to the car. The car acts like a Faraday cage, so the lightning hits it and it goes around the car. Again, don't touch the metal sides of the car. Like that's what you kind of want to do. It's not the rubber tires, it acts like the Faraday cage. But it's important to know these things as, as well and to, to think. And again, just like we just talked about, there are a range of scenarios based on what 
where you are, what you can do, what you can't do. Um, and, and I think we'll return to that as well. I hope that answers that, Tracy. Yes, I think so. Thank you. Yes, you've given us a lot to think about and especially thinking about our unique situations when we're at work, when we're at home, maybe when we're outside um, at a kid's event or, you know, someplace that we're not normally used to being that we should constantly be thinking about what those options are. So we're going to kind of move to the next category now, which I termed technically speaking because a few of these had a little bit more technical questions to them. Um, and then um, the first questions or series of questions here are really about when a tornado warning is issued um, and people were having questions about um, can you issue that prior to rotation being indicated on a radar or is that the trigger so I think just understanding what triggers the tornado warning in the first place and then people wondering if there are um, sirens in the area that they should be listening for um, and so kind of those two questions, are there, is there a trigger for the tornado warning? And then I see Chris's question that was in the chat box kind of um, along these same lines about, you know, what's happening within the weather forecasting offices when those things are um, issued. So I'll just start with that, see if anybody wants to take the lead, and then um, we can come back to Chris's question that was in the chat box. Do you want to kick that off, Ellen? The, the sort of what the forecaster warning decision making looks like? Sure. Um, you know, essentially, forecasters are looking at, I mean, there's just, there's copious data coming into the Weather Service office uh, to help make decisions on when to issue a tornado warning. Uh, Radar data is the is the biggest thing that they're looking at, but they're looking at satellite data. They're looking at, um, you know, they're getting reports from storm spotters, um, which is something that's not quite as uh, common and useful in the southeast because of the the terrain and the trees. And that's actually part of the reason we're doing Vortex Southeast is to try to uh, do studies to help both the public and the weather service as far as uh, being able to issue better warnings and being better prepared in the, you know, in the particular, with the particular regional challenges that exist in the Southeast. Um, but it's, it's really, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors that go into the decision of whether you know, when to issue a warning. Um, I'm not sure, was there, was there something beyond that, the, the question? Well, I just, uh, let me see if I can kind of summarize what Chris had put. He was wondering, so recently in Alabama, there was a tornado warning issued by the Huntsville office. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was encompassed um, a county that they cover, but there was an adjoining county on the southern border that was covered by a different National Weather Service office. And so they didn't necessarily agree that the storm was tornadic. And so um, how, how those kinds of things happen, um, the question I think was, um, if the meteorologists agree, um, or letting, let's see, letting the issuing office issue the warning for the county affected by this anomaly. So I think it's just what happens when there's one that covers both offices and they might, have a different reading on what's going on. Yeah, I think okay. is the gist of the question. Yeah, the uh, just for those that that aren't familiar, each weather service office has an area of responsibility that you know that's based on the counties that are the closest to their um, you know to their radar coverage and uh, site. And uh, so obviously there's there's borders between those areas. So and I actually I saw the the case that's being asked about yesterday where it was along the border between the Huntsville forecast office and the Birmingham forecast office. And the weather service offices have um, ways in which they can coordinate with each other. They have chat software, obviously they can pick up the phone and, and you know, and talk to the other forecasters about what they're seeing and, and collaborate on that. Um, and, and, and generally speaking, they, they try to come to a uh, you know, a consensus uh, solution. One of the things that we're actually testing here at the National Severe Storms Lab and our hazardous weather test bed are better tools and technologies to enable that collaboration to happen 
uh, more quickly and potentially look at ways in which uh, uh, forecasters would have the ability to issue warnings and products that might cross borders so that it would help smooth those kind of irregularities out. But that's those are things that we're still testing, but we're actually bringing in National Weather Service forecasters to help us test and evaluate these kind of technologies that would help uh, that would help with the situation that the, the two Alabama offices were facing yesterday. Great, thank you, Ellen. And then Tony, I'm gonna to throw this one over to you um, because it was kind of mentioned earlier, but it was how do satellites help with severe weather prediction? So in getting a, those models, do satellites have some kind of a, um, you know, a role? Yeah, so uh, when you see a weather forecast on TV, they'll often show the satellite picture of the clouds moving across the United States. And they'll point out, areas where there might be a front or there might be precipitation and there might be thunderstorms, but satellites can do a whole lot more than that. And one of the biggest keys, especially in helping forecast the weather for a satellite is that several of our satellite systems can actually detect and estimate uh, uh, like things like temperature, the humidity of the atmosphere, the winds in the atmosphere. And they can do that over large areas, including many areas that we can't get those measurements from the ground. So we can't launch weather balloons to get those measurements. We can't get, we don't put like surface stations to get the temperature and humidity at an airport, like we do at airports across the country. And I mean, most of those of course are across the oceans. So we can fill these huge gaps that exist where we don't have these observations available to us with satellite data. And that has, really been one of the bigger advancements in weather forecasting is our ability to take that data, put it into the models that have been developed over the years and actually you know, create a better understanding of what the atmosphere looks like at any given time and then base our forecasting off of that once you run the model out from that time. Awesome, thank you. And what kind of, this isn't really a follow on to that, but I think it's still sort of in your wheelhouse. Someone asked about what the biggest energy zapper is of a hurricane and what weakens them the quickest besides land. So the two things that will weaken it the quickest besides land are cold water and uh, vertical wind shear, the change of wind direction or wind speed with height. So hurricanes, they like to form in generally very calm environments, the, they're, the way that uh, they're structured. And they like to form in, in very warm tropical environments, obviously. So you take a hurricane, you move it out of the warm water, it's akin to moving it away from moving it over land. You lose the heat source, the main energy source for the hurricane by moving it either over land or over cold water. And then the wind shear will disrupt the how the hurricane is structured because it needs to be very vertically structured. And so as it begins to tilt, you, you don't have the same dynamics that drive the system at work anymore. And the system begins to, the hurricane begins to weaken. Yeah, I like that. I like that visual. When it starts to tilt, it starts to fall over, <laughs> fall over and lose, lose its strength. Um, and then I just want, before we leave this category, I just wanted to go back to um, the question about um, tornado siren testing. Um, someone wanted to know if there was a list by state of when they test the sirens, but I think probably that's also kind of just in general, if someone wants to speak to um, how we're feeling about the use of sirens and is that the same now across you know across the states? Yeah, sirens sure has stirred up a lot of controversy in the field of, of meteorology and um its interface with public safety. Kim, so so then, Kim, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it was it was breaking up for me. Was that so let's try let's maybe try one more time. Um can you oh, start, sure. it's giving us a still static from you. Still Okay, then maybe Justin or you know somebody else should take this question. Okay, sorry about that. I'll go ahead and yeah. Sorry. So, um, can you repeat the question again? Sorry, I thought I knew Kim was going to take it just briefly. Yes. Yes. No problem. Um, so 
uh, there was a question about um, siren testing because you know we get these alerts that say like that our for instance here at the uh, MEMA our Mississippi Emergency Management will say they're going to test the sirens and someone wanted to know is there like a list of when they're going to test these and then I think the other maybe broader question is maybe just about the use of sirens in general I know you guys have kind of educated me over these past few months about um, how maybe um, they're not using sirens as much in some areas as they used to. Yeah, so uh, sirens are sort of a, a double-edged sword. When they're in an urban environment and you can hear them, they can be a really good thing. But um, they're tested here every Saturday, apart from when there's an OU football game on, they're tested at 12 o'clock. And if you're kind of outside, you can hear them. If it's quiet inside, you might be able to hear them. Um, it had to be said that when um, we did, we were under that tornado warning, even though the tornado had passed us, um, we did hear that I did, we did hear the sirens at like one in the morning um, here. So that's quite a useful thing in terms of what they do county to county. Um, that's going to be a very much a very local thing. And I would contact my town hall and say, do you test and when do you test and when do I know if it's a test or not? Or just Google those sorts of things based on what county I lived in. So, you know, if I was in Etowah County in, 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 in Alabama, then I I'd, I'd put that in and go, do we have sirens? Are they tested? So I think that's a really good way. You know, again, be curious. That's what I was going goes back to what I was saying earlier on. And that curiosity extends to that as well. Um, I think what we covered earlier on is how many other technologies there are now for helping us know things and helping us be warned whether that's your uh, no weather radio whether it's having wireless alerts on your phone whether it's you know or, or social media stuff all of those things together gives us lots more information the more information we've got the clearer we should be able to know uh, about how we're acting to that kim i don't know if you wanted to add oh alan sorry yes go for it i think alan wants to add and i wanted to note that um jonathan gaddy had his hand raised so maybe i can take him off mute once Alan is finished. Yeah, I, I just wanted to just to kind of reinforce what, what Justin was saying so that, you know, that people understand that that the tornado siren policy is is completely a local decision. There is no state or federal policy on when to sound tornado sirens. So that that, you know, uh, of one some counties sound tornado sirens when severe thunderstorm warnings are issued. Others only when tornado warnings are issued. So as Justin is saying, you've really got to um, work with your, your local emergency manager or uh, community to find out what their particular policy is. Great, thank you all for that. I just wanted to make sure we circle back. Go ahead, Justin. To, to sort of follow on there that I think is actually essential, which is uh, it, it's good that there's sirens or not or whatever, but it's actually what you do and it's what you can do when those go off. So being prepared, I think it's also important to know if your county has shelters, are they open at a certain time? When are they open? Are they open in the, in the thunderstorm watch or a severe storm watch? You know, being, being aware of how all of those things work locally for you are fantastically, but um, it'll enable you to, you know, have higher survivability rates and, and hopefully lower rates of injuries and all those sorts of things. So it's all of those things together. There's lots of little things that you need to kind of check off. And actually one of the things that we're trying to do and develop is, is almost having like a, a severe weather checklist. You know, what do I know? Right, do I have some sort of shelter? Well, I don't have that, but what, can I go somewhere else? Each one of those things is important and it brings uh, you to be, excuse me, brings you to a place where you'll have a much clearer picture about I feel safer, I know what I'm going to do, I know what I'm going to do for my family. And that includes knowing what your local county uh, and emergency management might do and what they might advise. They may have, by the way, fantastic advice. You know, we found this in some of our research. Some counties really communicate excellently about exactly what they're going to do, exactly where there are shelters, exactly what they do with sirens. So just, just check it out in your local area. Great. Thank you, Justin and, um, and Alan and others. Um, that's, that's a really great um, advice is to just 
have some personal responsibility when it comes to these things. And um, Jonathan, I saw your um, your chat, so we're going to move on to um, lightning, and that is our next topic. And we had a couple of questions here that dealt with: Do the seconds between when you see lightning and hear thunder really tell you how many miles away the storm is? And then we got that question a couple of different times. So, um, Tony, I don't know if you want to lead us off with that one, um, but that seems to be. Uh, the question of the day. <laughs> yeah, sure. So think about it this way. If you see a lightning flash, light moves very, very fast, right? You're, you, so you see it almost instantaneously after it happens, once it happens. Sound also moves fast, but not nearly as fast. So the average, the typical speed of sound is about 767 miles per hour which means that it's traveling about two tenths of a mile every second or about one mile every five seconds. So yes, I mean, if, if the lightning flash that you see is the flash responsible for the thunder that you're hearing, then yes, you can estimate how far away that flash occurred. And the key is, are you actually hearing the thunder from the flash you saw first or is there a flash you know, somewhere else that maybe you're hearing? initially. Um, so you want to be a little bit careful using that as your estimator. But yeah, that and that feeds back into like the 30-30 rule that, that Justin mentioned. If you hear, if you see lightning and hear thunder within 30 seconds, then the source storm is is likely close is close enough for you to be able to struck be struck by a different flash that it might produce. You know, it, it sometimes you need to get inside and then wait 30 minutes to to leave again. But yeah, that is actually that is actually how that works. About every five seconds that you can count is about a mile away that that flash of lightning occurred. Okay, great. So is it also true that lightning strikes the tallest object in the area? So the person asked, if you were standing near a large tree or power pole, you likely wouldn't be struck? No, that is not necessarily true. There is a tendency for lightning to try to strike the higher objects, but you don't want to count on that. I mean, for instance, I was part of, in my previous career, uh, previous job, I was in a field campaign and one of our instrument trucks got struck by lightning. The lightning strike was actually somewhere else where we believe it was in a, like in the middle of a field adjacent to uh, where the the, the uh, vehicle was parked and the vehicle was one of the highest, the tallest things around, but it, um, we believe hit the field based on the fact there were no direct burn marks in the, on the truck or any of the equipment, but it came in to the, the lightning, the electricity came in from several different ways through several of the different instruments and fried several. Now, luckily all of our participants who were with that truck were inside and, and safe inside the, the vehicle. Um, but no, you, I mean, while there is a slight tendency for lightning to look for, if you will, or be attracted to the highest object, you certainly don't want to count on that as part of your safety plan. Okay, good to know. Definitely something we want to debunk that myth. Um, and then finally, in this category, um, just one more was about the hair standing up on your head. And if, does that happen and potential danger of lightning strike? Is that one thing? Um, out of several that should be a warning to seek shelter. Um, and then the other question follow on to that was, are there wearable devices or phone apps that can detect electrified conditions ahead of a strike? So the hair standing on anything, that, that is real. And I have, having done field work in severe storms, have experienced that a few times. That's when you bolt for the indoors or bolt for the car <laughs> when you're out in the field. Um, that's went from the, the buildup of static charge near the ground, uh, near a thunderstorm in an you know, electrified environment. Uh, as for mobile apps or devices, I, I know, well, we discussed this beforehand and I, we, I'm not aware of any off the top of my head. I know that there are some parks, for instance, that have like in situ, they have, they have observational devices that can detect lightning within a certain range. So if you're at like a playground or a ball park, you know, ball fields with your kids or, or soccer fields, some of those do have those, but I don't know of any that you can actually wear on you and have on your person as you're out and about. 
Great. So we're we're kind of rounding out our time to our last category, um, and then I'll give our panelists um, an opportunity if you wanted to add on to something. But we're going to kind of move to the historical category real quickly. These are questions that I think just have an answer, but I might be wrong about that. So um, I'll just ask them one at a time. This is the first one was about when was the last major freeze in coastal Mississippi, and what is the normal frequency? Well, I can tell you that, I, I mean, obviously part of the answer to this question is what, what one considers a major freeze. Um, I went back and looked through the records and what I would consider a major freeze for coastal Mississippi, the last one was in 2010. That was, that was a period of time where uh, um, there were, uh, there was about a week to 10 day period where you know, the low temperatures were mainly in the 20s. Uh, Gulfport got down to 19 one morning and 18 one morning. So this was January of 2010. So that, that you know, that would be probably what I would consider, you know, I mean, if you want to talk the, the biggest cold snap in, you know, in semi-recent memory, would it be the Christmas 1989 when uh, um, uh, Gulfport got down to nine degrees on two different mornings on the 23rd and the 24th? So, um, you know, I, I mean, I would, I don't have a specific statistic. I, you know, I would say general, you know, as far as frequency, probably about once a decade. Uh, you know, the coast has a. Uh, you know, what I would consider a major freeze along those lines, but um, anyway. Oh, good. That means I don't have to bring my plants in tonight, so maybe, <laughs> maybe leave them out a little longer. Okay, the next one on their historical was, what is the slowest hurricane on record moving through a Gulf area? And the person asked, is it Danny or Sally? So I think they clearly thought it might be one of those two, but I'm not sure if it's either of those, the slowest hurricane on record. I'm not sure there's really an answer to this question because the there's a, there's been lots of hurricanes along the coast that have moved very slowly. Um, Danny's definitely a good example, um, but uh, George back in the late '90s was another good example of a very slow-moving hurricane that impacted the Mississippi and Alabama coast. Um, you know, if you're talking about the Gulf Coast generally, um, Harvey, uh, you know, was obviously another one that was moving extremely slowly on the Texas coast and produced all the massive flooding in Houston area. Um, uh, one thing I will comment on is that there is a fair amount of uh, research that appears to be showing that slow moving tropical cyclones are becoming more frequent uh, uh, along the coast and that that likely has something to do with climate change. Um, so that that's certainly something to be aware of. We certainly um, seem to be getting increasing impacts from slow moving tropical cyclones in the United States. So something, uh, something for us to be aware of. Great, thank you, Alan. And then um, one of the other questions this category was, what is the largest hurricane in diameter ever measured? have the answer to that. Uh, the largest Atlantic hurricane was Sandy. Um, uh, it, it measured 1150 miles. And generally speaking, we measure hurricanes based on the radius of gale force winds. So um, Sandy was actually the largest Atlantic hurricane. If you're talking about globally, the largest uh, tropical cyclone on record is Typhoon Tip, uh, which was also the strongest. Uh, uh, tropical cyclone on record, and it was 1,380 miles, which is about about half the size of the contiguous United States. That's really impressive. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so thank you very, very much. We got um, through those, we're, we're at a minute of our time. I just wanted to ask our panelists, did you have any last parting thoughts that you wanted to, um, to add as we wrap up today? Just thought the questions that came in were excellent. Thank you.
yes yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone so, for participating with that go ahead tony i'm sorry i was just going to say thank you to everyone there's some really good questions in there And so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to share my screen as we're leaving here and it has my contact information. And so if you have like additional questions that maybe didn't get answered today, or if you have any questions about the Vortex Southeast program, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I'd love to hear what you have to say and hear any questions that you have. And I just wanted to thank one more time all of our panelists. Thank you, Justin and Tony and Kim and Alan for being with us this morning. I learned a lot. Um, I hope that that our attendees learned a lot and um, we'll have to do this again sometime, do another roundup. So thanks everyone for participating and um, have a great holiday season. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.